Okay. Thank you. So to repeat again, I'm Gemma Wood. I'm the UN Trust Fund Monitoring and Evaluation and Knowledge Manager, and I lead on the training sessions. Today's first training session is on just introducing us, introducing you to each other, and introducing you um, to what it means to be a UN Trust Fund grantee. I'm also going to explain to you about the training objectives and why we do these trainings. So moving on to the first slide, um, as I said, this is it's intended to introduce you to the trust fund. And congratulations on receiving a US trust, trust, trust fund grant. It's a very competitive process. We receive over a, a thousand applications a year. So we're really delighted that you're joining us and that you've received a grant. Um, we have been going for many, many years, and I'll, I'll tell you more about the history of the fund. So you do join a very wide network of grantees. Um, and what you will have received is what we call the Project Cooperation Agreement. And this is what signs and determines your grant and makes sure you can receive the money. And the purpose of this session is to try and demystify the project cooperation agreement because there's a lot of key terms in there, there's a lot of information, and if you're new to the trust fund or the UN, you may not understand all of that. So we want to explain what that means. And the project cooperation agreement is further determined through the grantees handbook, which explain those terms in much more detail. So the overall objective of the training, the training package, which is the 10 projects, the 10 modules, is that you will have hopefully the skills to understand the project cooperation agreement and how to implement it. And basically, we want to help you to be accountable for the grant and to achieve the expected results as set out in your project document in a safe and ethical way. And once you've done the training, we hope you will have the skills to really apply the terms of the project cooperation agreement. And ultimately, as in all our goal, we simply want us all to be able to achieve what we set out in our project proposals. And that is the ultimate vision of helping to end violence against women and girls. So, so just let's all keep that goal in mind. A lot of this seems very technical, very managerial, very frankly boring. I don't mind saying that this session might be a little bit boring, but the ultimate goal is to help achieve results for women and girls. And so everything we, we're explaining is best practice in project management to help you achieve what's set out in your project document. So that's the purpose of the training. Many of you are not new to project management, you may well be experts in project management and experts in the field of ending violence against women. So as we progress through the training, we also want to learn from each other and learn from you. Um, there are over 100 people who signed up for this training, so there's an amazing amount of expertise that we can share together. The mandatory sessions are going to be 10 over the next few months. And they follow the process of the grantee handbook. And in the grantee's handbook, you will see there are sections on planning for your project, planning data collection, financial management, operations, project approaches, ethics and safety, and so forth. So the step-by-step -step through the 10 modules, we will cover what was in the um, grantee's handbook and what's in the um, project cooperation agreement. There are also some key tasks which we have asked you to complete. In the email that you received from Tanya, it set out including a project 
startup action plan, some key tasks that you have to achieve within the first seven months of the project. Again, the reason is that this is simply best practice in project management. Hopefully, many of you are familiar with these tasks in terms of having a solid results and resources framework, which is sometimes called a logical framework, having data collection tools, having baseline data, having operational manuals. Most of this won't be new to you, but for those of you who may have never done this before, we're here for you. This is what the training is for. And we ask you to have these key elements in place within the first seven months because we find this really determines success. If you have these uh, um, things in place, you're very clear on what you aim to achieve and how you want to measure it, then you're more likely to have a successful project. Likewise, if you think about your operations and financial manuals and how you're managing your project at the beginning, you're more likely to have good financial management, less likely to have um, a negative audit. So that's why we put these in place in the first seven months. And then, great, you can get on with your project. If anyone's just joining, if you could put your um, microphone on mute. I think I can hear a few people talking in the background. So I'm just going to uh, so I'm just going to make sure that you're all on mute before I continue. So we put this all in the email that Tanya sent you in terms of making sure that you have a good plan to start your project. Um, and we, you don't have to use all of the elements that we gave you. Um, these are Some of them are just recommendations. Okay, I think they put themselves on mute. So the grantee handbook is there for you. We will be sending you the sections to the grantee handbook as we go through the training. So the first part of the handbook you've been given is the introduction to the project cooperation agreement. Um, you will receive the other parts as you proceed through the training. So that's the fun bit, who are we? So the UN Trust Fund and Violence Against Women has been actually around for 20 years, since 1996. And we're one of the only, we're the only uh, multilateral global interagency mechanism on violence against women. Um, so we're exclusively dedicated to supporting efforts to prevent and end violence against women. We are managed by UN women. We're housed in UN women in New York, but we, um, we do represent the entire of the UN system on our board, we have um, UNICEF, a UNFPA, we have NGOs and researchers. So although we're managed by UN Women, we do represent a much broader um, stakeholder group. Um, our strategy for the last five years, up to 2020, is focused on three main areas. The giving the grants, which is what we've done with, with you with 31 new grants this year. Secondly, we very much want to gather and generate evidence from the projects that we fund. This is why we, um, we focus heavily, you will see in the training on data collection. We want to help generate evidence to inform new projects. And then we also use that evidence and the results to raise more money and to, to advocate for increased political commitment and funding for violence against women. So in all these years of grant making, we've supported 493 grants in 139 countries um, and over 129 million. So we have a very broad portfolio. And the region with the most grants has actually been Africa, um, which is understandable given the size of Africa uh, and the number of countries. Um, 
but interestingly, we've awarded most grants in Cambodia and Peru, and I think we have representatives from both those countries in this, this year's cycle. Um, now, that's not to say that we chose to fund Cambodia and Peru for a specific reason. It's, it is competitive. And every year, we don't know who will apply. We don't know what countries will come out the top because, as I said, we have thousands of applications every year. And it is uh, grants are awarded on the basis of the quality of your application and the evidence that it can achieve results. So it's just an interesting fact that we have funded most uh, awards in Cambodia and Peru. I'm not going to show this to you now, but you'll have it in, your, um, in the slides. There's a short video available on um, who we are and what we do and the kinds of projects that we fund. So you can watch that at your leisure. So what about you? You've joined this, um, this group, this family of grantees funded by the UN Trust Fund. Um, there are 31 of you this year. We fund around 20 to 30 grants every year. And you were 31 of 1,301 applicants. So that's fantastic. You went through a rigorous appraisal process you had to do your proposal, your concept note. We thank you for your patience with all the many questions that we gave you in terms of the budget and your project and your program. Thank you for the patience. This year, we're funding 31 projects in 25 countries. And again, the region with the most projects is in Africa. And Kenya has the most awards. Um, so through getting to know each other, we can put you in, in touch with each other. We very much like to network within countries. The portfolio managers assigned to your region will hold additional sessions potentially with, with you in your regions so that you can get to know other organizations funded by us if you wish. So what do we do to support you? What's the value of being um, a UN Trust Fund grantee? Well, we're here in New York, but we, uh, we try to be as hands-on as, as possible in supporting you. And that's why you will have one dedicated person that we call a portfolio manager who will be your key contact and advisor in the UN Trust Fund. Um, if you don't know their name, then please let us know. There's Mildred, Anna, Fiona, and well, I'll introduce a few of them are online, Lorna. So I'll introduce you at the end. They can say hi. So they're there committed to providing you support and guidance throughout your project. You will also receive this online training package. And throughout the three years of your project, there may be the opportunity for further training and coaching and knowledge exchange. We will uh, give you regular and responsive feedback to your project reports. Um, we will talk about that later, but you will be expected to report on your project every six months. And we hope through our advice, we can help um, improve the project we can um, give you tips and ideas for how to um, improve either your project management or your financial management. Um, we like to give you as much visibility as possible. Um, some of you have very visible and, and um, well-known brands anyway. Your organizations are very well known. But the added value of being a UN Trust Fund grantee will be that we will promote your project and your organization if it's going well through events and through reports. So we will use our Twitter, um, our social media, Facebook websites to promote your organization with the ultimate goal of raising more resources. So what do we expect from you? Well, we know that most of you online are the, the dedicated person for this project. We ask you to have a dedicated 
project director who properly signed the project cooperation agreement. And then beyond that, we asked you to nominate two staff to lead on liaising with us, and they will take this training. And through the training, you can learn how to be accountable for the funds entrusted from the UN Trust Fund. One of the things that we require you to do is the six monthly reporting, and we will teach you and tell you how to do the, the report. We hope it won't be too on onerous. And we do ask you to make sure that you maintain very good project records, especially the financial records. And so we do have specific rules on that. Furthermore, we expect, and we know that you, you do this anyway, I'm sure, is we have this commitment to making sure that we do no harm. This is especially important in the field of ending violence against women. We have to be committed to managing risks, to protecting the rights of women and girls, and all those involved, both project staff and beneficiaries, and to make sure that we do no harm through our project. That is why one of our mandatory requirements is that you have ethical and safety protocols in place for your project and policies on prevention of sexual harassment. So more on that later. And we, um, but on the more fun stuff, we, we do ask you to share as many stories as you can from your project, communication materials, knowledge products, um, so that we can share and learn together. So talking about the project cooperation agreement, it is a legal binding, legally binding document, which might sound a little bit scary, and we don't want it to be. Um, it's obviously a lot of UN speak, it's a technical document. Um, you may look at it and not understand all the terminology, and, and that's why we're doing this, this session. Um, so it's legally binding, it's signed between you on behalf of your organization and UN Women on behalf of the Trust Fund. And importantly, the project cooperation agreement is accompanied by your project document, which was the project proposal, including your results framework and any annual work plans. So that is a package that goes with your project cooperation agreement. The PCA lays out many principles, and these are just gen general principles of the UN, which we expect organizations we fund to fulfill, such as um, a commitment to being apolitical, a commitment for not being profit-making, a commitment to being participatory and accountable. So there's a lot of jargon here, but we unpack it in the grantee handbook. In practical terms, what did you sign? You signed your life away. You didn't. You, you signed for just two or three years. So um, you signed the, the project. I think all of you are three-year projects. So in that PCA, you signed um, that you would deliver a project within the three years. And uh, we want to inform you now, just to make sure that it's very clear that we do not. Um, that it's very rare that we would agree to a no-cost extension beyond the three years. Um, the process of requesting a no-cost extension is stipulated in the PCA, but we have a stringent policy on no-cost extensions. They're very, very rare, and um, uh, our default is to say no. This is because um, we expect, because we think projects will be so well managed that I'm sure they'll all be achieved within the three years. But no, more importantly, it's because of our budgets and our need to be very sure on how much we're spending and how much money we will need to award each year. So there's no, no cost extensions, just to make that clear, beyond the three years. Um, but within that three years, there is uh, an opportunity to modify the budget. So don't be worried if you think today, oh, my project document was very ambitious. That's to be expected. When people write their project documents, they tend 
to be over ambitious. That's why we have the next six to seven months to work with you to make sure the results framework is well targeted, well designed, so you can achieve it within the three months. Um, so during project implementation, implementation, circumstances may arise that require you to modify your budget or modify parts of your results and activity sections of your project document. And that's absolutely fine this, that we have processes to do that. Um, you can vary your budget within 20% on any one direct project activity line, but anything beyond 20% would have to be consulted and approved by the UN Trust Fund. So these rules will be explained further. Um, we don't want to be scary, but we have to get these things out. Now there is the possibility that if things are going wrong, we would terminate the project. It has happened. So if we see that the project objectives are not being achieved or the PCA is not being applied uh, in the manner expected, um, there is a risk that we would have to suspend or terminate the project. Um, this is if we see that circumstances are interfering with a successful completion of the project. However, the main message is communication, communication, communication. If we're able to talk with you and discuss changes to the project before any need of a suspension arises, that's, that's the best way. But the PCA sets out um, both your rights and our rights in terms of whether or not we would need to suspend a project. Um, so what else does the project cooperation agreement say? Well, on project planning, um, just suffice to say, it doesn't say a great deal, but the PCA does say that the project document is the key annex And the project document sets out the activities, the work plan, the inputs, the budget. In terms of our um, working documents, this means the results and resources framework. So the PCA states that you will achieve the results in the results and resources framework. Hence, we will work with you over the next three months to make sure that results framework is as specific and uh, well drafted as possible so that you can achieve it. The UN Trust Fund grantees are expected to design, plan and manage the project well to ensure it has the best chance of achieving those project objectives. So we're now at the project planning stage. So from the point of signing the project cooperation agreement till three months, which is now um, two months, um, we have the opportunity to look again at the results framework and see whether you want to improve or change anything. You are required to collect data and to monitor the project effectively, as that's the only way that any of us will know whether that project document is being achieved. And the RRF, the Results and Resources Framework, is the document we will use to monitor the indicators and to see whether you are achieving the targets. Um, and we will help you improve that document. Once that's improved, we will use that results framework as a key tool for monitoring, and you will report against that every six months. And your report is due 30 days after that six months is up. So for example, if you're, um, so in six months time, so September, February, your report um, will be due at the end of March for the period from September uh, to February, for example. But I have an example I will show you. Um, once you've completed your report, uh, once a year, we will release the second installment. Um, but the installments are on um, the proviso that you will have a satisfactory um, report. Um, so we will verify your expenditure, verify the reports, and you will. Um, we expect you to have 80% of your expenditure achieved, 
And only if we have seen 80% expenditure of the previous year will we release the next tranche. The PCA sets out the reporting requirements and the deadlines for you quite clearly in your individual project cooperation agreement. So the slide that we have on screen is just an example. So please refer to your um, PCA and your specific project. Um, but as I said, you will be expected to deliver a report every six months, but you have one month to do it after that period. So um, if your project was beginning in January, you would expect the report to be delivered in July, so seven months after that date, and then every six months after that. Six monthly reporting is quite standard for projects. Obviously, if you're doing more regular reporting, you can do that as often as you want in, internally. It's just that your external report to the trust fund is only required every six months, and you do it on our grants management system, which we will explain. As well as the reports every six months, you will do a final report at the end of the project one month after the project ends. And then finally, you will have an external evaluation report where you will be expected to hire an external evaluator to complete that for you. And that will be expected two months after the project ends. So the basic message is reporting every six months and a final evaluation report and we will give you very specific instructions on how to do the reporting. The reporting that you will do uh, will include um, both um, results reporting and financial reporting. So I'm going to get more into the financial requirements now. Um, the maximum amount of funds that will be made available to you in your project is very clearly stated in the project document, and all disbursements are made in US dollars. Grantee organizations are expected to confirm the receipt of your funds. You should be receiving the funds now. Some of you have received them already. And you must note the exchange rate um, at the date of receipt and provide the UN Trust Fund with a copy of the corresponding bank statement so we have that exchange rate on record. The project cooperation agreement in details your installment schedule and how much you will receive each year and the conditions that need to be met to receive the disbursements. For example, it specifies that the first installment is generally dispersed within 30 days from when the agreement is signed and subsequent advances are only released when satisfactory reports and other agreed upon documentation have been submitted to the trust fund. As mentioned before, you can make variations and make budget adjustments if it's less than 20% change on any direct project activity line, as long as the total budget allocated by the trust fund is not exceeded. But if you want to make changes during the year um, that are over 20%, you would come and discuss that with your UN Trust Fund portfolio manager before doing so. So I hope that's clear. For management costs, we don't allow any variation. You cannot veer or via money in or out of the management costs. Um, if you don't spend all your money, you will have to return it at the end. So we do encourage you to plan your project well so that you can spend the full grant amount. Um, and um, importantly, um, we will not pay for any expenses that were not in the project budget unless it was explicitly agreed in writing. So if you need to suddenly make a change to a project activity, and you need to spend money on something that was not in the original budget, you should immediately come and speak to your portfolio manager to get authorization for that. 
Sound financial management, as you know, I'm sure, requires uh, good record keeping. And um, the PCA sets out how we expect you to maintain records. And it says you must keep accurate and up-to-date records and documents of all expenses incurred. Please note that based on our policies, you will, we will verify between 5% to 100% of your expenses. And for the, at the first project report, at the first six months, it is 100%. What does this mean? This means we will ask you to scan and send us all your invoices or proof of payment for that reporting period, or our focal points, um, you and women, in some cases, our UN women um, contacts in country will help us with that, where we validate your expenses against your expenditure. So it's very important that you keep all copies of invoices, payments on file. Um, this may seem very heavy handed, but we hope and that through this process we can help you manage your, your finance as well. It is useful in the first six months to have this process because it helps identify any issues early on so there are no issues for the remainder of the project. So we're here to, to this process is to help, it's to help us be accountable to our donors and it's help you to be accountable to us and it also means that we, for, for some of you, we can help you avoid any negative audit findings we can help you meet the standards of the UN. We've had very good feedback from other organizations who've helped with this process, who have gone on to be able to receive money from other donors, including the EU, because they, there is a trust that, well, all the UN Trust Fund has helped check the records, and therefore there's a level of, um, of, of, of greater trust. Um, so I really hope that for some of you it will be useful and um, for all of us, we, we all need to be accountable um, to our donors. So I hope you understand that. And we'll try and make it as simple and as easy as possible for all of us. So importance of maintaining good records. And we have a whole uh, module on that in more detail. So I'm just covering the basics. So what else does it say in the um, in the PCA? Well, on the operational side, um, it says uh, some information about personnel. Um, we do expect any staff that you hire for the project to meet the highest standards of qualifications and competence. Um, what does this mean? Well, it means that if you said in your project document that you had expertise on ending violence against women. We will expect you to have some staff in your organization who are experts. Um, if you said that you would have M&E staff or finance staff, um, we will refer to your um, organizational section of your project document and expect you to meet the standards that you promised. So if now you want to review your and check that you, you have the personnel that you needed in place and that you promised um, to be able to implement the project, or maybe you will need to hire consultants as agreed in your project document. Um, you are responsible for the behavior and the actions and the, well, as far as you can, you are responsible for the professionalism of that staff and to ensure that they are free of any conflict of interest um, and that they deliver the services. On procurement, um, you are obliged to maintain accurate and complete records and to have proper procurement processes in place. We have sent you a procurement questionnaire to help you because we know for some, especially small organizations, this might be quite new to you in terms of um, following a specific procurement guideline. Um, we, for example, expect you to make sure that you are achieving and getting the highest quality economy and efficiency when procuring goods. What does this mean? Well, 
that you might get three quotes. So practically, if you were going to buy some equipment, you wouldn't buy the first computer. You would look at the evidence. You would see, well, I've picked um, the most efficient or the, the most cost effective um, for your context. And we would expect you to document that. Um, likewise, if you're hiring personnel, good procurement process would be that you review CVs um, and you interview personnel before giving them the job and that you would have documented the process so that you're not just giving the job to the first person who comes along. And we will want to see evidence that you are putting in place these proper processes. Finally, on the operational arrangement, um, you may be audited, and that is why I've told you all of this. So it, this may seem heavy, but what we want to do is avoid any problems later. Um, you may be picked at random to be audited by our global audit firm. Although I say that it's at random, it's actually sometimes to do with the risk level. So if, for example, we found that you had some documents missing, we weren't able to verify your expenditure, there's a higher risk you will be audited. Likewise, if you have a million dollar project, that's more risky to us, you're more likely to be audited. So it's a risk-based selection. Um, but not all of you will be audited. But you may be within, say, the second uh, or even first year. Um, and the auditors would come in and they would check your records and they would determine whether everything had been expended as per our rules. Um, and they may request any ineligible expenses to be returned. So UN Trust Fund follows accepted industry practice um, for risk-based selection, um, risk-based criteria for audit selection. And uh, you may be audited even more than once during the project lifetime. Uh, again, we help you through the entire process if that happens. And we have a lot of tips and examples. And this is why we do the training. So you may be audited. We're nearly at the end of the project cooperation agreement. Um, near the end of the document, you will see some um, oh, sections on um, communications and ethics and safety. Ethics and safety comes up a number of times in the project cooperation agreement. Um, it's vital that you identify any ethical and safety risks, both in your project activities, but also in the management of your organization. Um, Organizations must have strong safeguards in place to manage safety and ethical risks. Um, this is either, it's important in any project, but the fact that we're working on violence against women, where every day we have to be aware of power dynamics, of gender relations, we have to be, we have to excel at this. Um, and that's, that's, that's a high burden on us. And we know, and you know, the UN has not done well on this, we can all admit. And um, that's why we're working on ourselves and why we encourage all organizations to do the same. So together, let's get better at this. And we do have a zero tolerance policy on any evidence of sexual exploitation and abuse of beneficiaries and project staff. So therefore, we do ask that you have a policy in place and procedures both an internal complaint procedure for reporting any allegations of sexual, um, sexual exploitation and abuse, and also measures for investigating those within your organization. If you don't have such mechanism in place, then we require you to institute that within the first year, within the first year. And again, we hope that this, this is useful for all of us because there's such a great attention on this right now to make sure that all, all and many of you already have these in place. So let's share lessons and let's share experiences. So that's to do with your staff safety and also beneficiaries that you work with. In addition to that, 
during your data collection, we would expect you to have um, protocols in place that you're not re-traumatizing survivors, that you're asking questions in the most sensitive way. So there are also ethics and safety considerations when um, doing data collection and project activities. So we have a whole training session on that. Um, and then finally, when it comes to um, your, the training, as I mentioned, uh, it does stipulate in the PCA the requirements for you to do the training and to dom nominate two people to do the training. You don't have to watch these videos. You can just do the tests, which I will send to you after this. On communications, we, um, we have a communications guideline. We ask that you um, use our logo within certain rules. So if you need to use the UN Trust Fund logo to put on a poster or a pamphlet or um, a document, then we have some guidelines on how, how the logo, when it should be used. And we also ask to check um, those documentations before publication. So the basic rule on comms is use of our logo. I think I've covered most of the PCA. So to recap, this session has covered how we work together. And as I said, you'll have a personal portfolio manager dedicated to supporting you, and you will receive training and coaching. And on your turn, we uh, expect you to have two people dedicated to the project who will do the training. We expect you to do regular reporting and to understand and implement the project cooperation agreement. The cooperation agreement includes many different articles, so please read it carefully. The project cooperation agreement includes specific articles on project planning, on reporting, on finances, on personnel, on procurement and audit, on ethics and safety, and the capacity development training. So what I would recommend you do after this session, and we're going to pause now for questions, but what I recommend is read the P PCA very carefully, see if you don't understand anything and ask us questions, identify any weaknesses or gaps in your operations or your project document. Read the grantees handbook because that should help. And then together in your team plan, well, what do we need to do to help implement this project? And that's what your action plan is for. There are some basic requirements such as delivery of the results framework, but you might want to add additional tasks. And some of them will be individual to you, your organization such as, for example, you may need to put a sexual exploitation and abuse policy in place. And then the more fun bit, um, we will be sharing with you um, the Facebook group that we have. So today's session has been very heavy on the technical side. But after this session, every module we will give you will be more on practically how we can deliver projects for our vision of ending violence against women. And we will focus more on learning from you and um, focus more on sharing knowledge. So this, this session is the only one that will hopefully be so heavy in terms of the technical, um, the technical side. And the rest, we hope, will just help you manage your projects, both this project and future projects. So in that spirit, please do join our network of grantees, we have a Facebook page, which I will send to you, where you can share stories, share tips, share knowledge with other UN Trust Fund grantees. So that's the end of this module. And now I'm going to open for questions. And again, apologies for the um, technical errors at the beginning. I will do this session again, I think, another live session, just in case for those who had too many, uh, who may have had technical difficulties. We we'll also have the um, recorded version available.
So I'm going to stop sharing my screen so you can see. And I'm also going to ask Tanya if um, I'm just going to go get Tanya as well. Tanya Ghani, maybe she can help answer any questions. Um, what I suggest you do if you have a question is there is a, um, a chat function. So you can either put your hand, you can use the chat function, chat function to ask any questions. Let's see, I think I saw some questions earlier. So I don't know whether everyone can see on the right. Um, there was a chat box, and I will probably uh, limit it to using the chat box because there's so many people online, it will be quite hard to hear. So yes, apologies for the... Uh... Um, so we had some people who were finding it difficult to access the meeting, so I'll resend the instructions. We also, every time, will send you the script so you can read the script. Um, so for those who are hard of hearing, um, we, we do have the script that you can read. So I'll resend that. And we'll also be in the recorded session adding subtitles. Um, so sorry, I'm just reading through the questions. Okay, so who has a question? So Gert, Gertan, yes, said, is it possible for each of the portfolio managers to make a short presentation? Yes, they're very welcome to, and they may do separate sessions for each region, but I'm going to see if um, anybody would like to introduce themselves right now. Let's see. Fiona, Mildred, Lorna, would anyone like to introduce themselves? Valentina, I've taken you off mute. Hello? Hi, Valentina. Would you like to introduce yourself? Hi, everybody. Um, I'm Valentina Lujudis. I'm working with grants management team. I was coordinating the call for proposal, the last one, and I bet you received quite a few emails from me. Um, and w which projects will you be helping with? Um, it's a only 21st cycle right now, right? Right? Yeah. Well, I will be taking care of so with cycle 20 and 19. Ah, okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. But I might have some communication going back and forth. So I can't, the other portfolio managers will introduce themselves, hopefully separately to you in an email or they will do a Skype session for you. Um, Jonathan asked, Oh, so we have a question on um, from Saprora Shehu. Sorry if I pronounced your name wrong. You would like to know about the final evaluation. Is it the UN Trust Fund who will sign a consultant for the developing the evaluation or the grantees? Well, this depends firstly on the type of grant you receive. If you have a small grant, which is $150,000 or less, it will be the UN Trust Fund managing and organizing your evaluation and selecting who will have an evaluation. For all large grants over $150,000, it will be you. You will manage, uh, the grantee will manage the whole process. You should recruit the evaluator. So we will cover that in the section on data collection, monitoring, and evaluation. Jonathan Haggard asked, may anyone on, your, on our team communicate with the portfolio manager? Yes, anyone in the team can communicate. Um, it doesn't have to be the project director. Um, it is useful, though, to keep it to the, as we say, we ask you to nominate two focal points. So try and keep it limited, not um, because if there's a lot of emails going back and forth, you may not be able to coordinate very well. So um, it's easier if one person communicates with the portfolio manager. It doesn't have to be the project director. Also, your finance staff, once we get to the finance module, we have finance associates here 
you're very welcome for the finance staff to communicate directly with our finance staff because that's easier. Um, okay, so Nora asked, we would like to contract our partner organizations to conclude the subcontract. Please clarify, are we eligible for that and how this should be done? I'm just going to get uh, Tanya to help. Mm -hmm. Yes. Hi, everyone. Can you hear me? Yes, please introduce Great. yourself, Tanya. Hi, good morning and good evening for those who are joining us uh, from different parts of the world. This is Tanya Mani. I'm the grants manager for the UN Trust Fund. Um, and I'll take this question from Nora and the following one from Patrick, because they both have to do um, with finance and operations. Mm -hmm. So, um, Nora, yes, uh, you are able to contract with your partner organization, um, especially if this is something that has already been included in your project document. What we generally tell organizations to do is to make sure that you follow um, your own rules and procedures, make sure that you have some sort of an agreement in place with the organization that um, sets out the terms of the subcontract. And um, so you should use your whatever own, your own uh, systems and processes are. What we do always state is that you as the grant organization are responsible for 100% of the funds. So what this means is that even the money that you subcontract and give out to the organization, when it comes to the um, financial report and the document verification, you will be expected to make sure that you have all the records on your files so that when we request them for our 100% verification, you are able to share them with us. So that is the requirement from our end on ensuring the fiduciary responsibility on your part. If you would like to discuss this further, please um, do feel free to send me an email and I will communicate you, um, I will put you in touch with our finance. Is that clear, um, or is there anything else on that that you would like to know, Nora? You can put it in the chat. Um, I'll move then to the next question on the from Patrick, which is kindly clarify on the certification of the annual financial report. Who will do the certification and how? It is is it just the stamp or the auditor? Um, we will be discussing this further during our um, financial management module. But what we mean by certification at this stage is that when you submit your six-month financial and progress report, it will be reviewed by the UN Trust Fund. We may have some questions on the report, and we will be reviewing the, the financial supporting documents. Once the report has been reviewed and cleared by us, we will resend it to you for you to certify. So whoever in your organization is responsible for certification of financial reports, that person has to do the sign-off. That's what it requires. It's just a stamp. We do not require an auditor uh, to do any certification at this stage. If your project is going to be audited, that's a separate process, and we will be in touch with you on that when we talk about operational management of the trust fund. Um, Gemma, can I continue with the next question as yes. well? Yes, okay. please do. So, uh, so what Martin uh, is asking, uh, what happens when after grants transfer, there is a dollar gain by 20 to 30 percent above the total grant amount? Can the organization use these funds for non-budgeted expenditures within the project? Um, you can read the grantee uh, manual. I cannot remember 100 percent off the top of my head what the rule is, but um, my understanding is that the trust fund is not going to be responsible for any um, expenditure gain or loss. So please bear with me. I will come back to you on that in detail um, to tell you if it is possible for you to utilize it. My sense is that it may be, but I'm not 100% certain. Um, uh, Abdu is asking that for projects that is in phase two, do we have to redo staff recruitment process again, or can we continue with former staff, giving them uh, pretty much familiar with the project and direct beneficiary? Um, Abdu, I understand this will probably just be um, the 
extension of existing staff. And, if, and in that case, as long as you have supporting documentation, I think that should be sufficient. Um, Angelina is also asking, are grantee agencies allowed to subcontract directly with co-implementing agencies, or does this have to be done by UN Trust Fund? Uh, the UN Trust Fund is not involved in your engagement with your co-implementing partner. We will give you the money directly uh, for your project. Then it is your responsibility to get, um, enter into agreements with your co-implementing partners, do the transfer of funds to your co-implementing partners, and manage the resources and reporting from your co-implementing partners. Um, Gemma, do you want to talk about the um, standardized reporting tools and when they will be shared? Sure. So um, we can share the um, standardized tools within the next uh, few weeks. We're putting together the rest of the grantees' handbook, um, but it will be explained in most depth when we get to the, um, the training module. But yes, we have a full guidance on the reporting and the template for the reporting, and that will be on our online grants management system. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Tanya. Uh, let's see if there's any other questions. Um, Tanya, there's another question yes. on rate of exchange. Uh, it, okay, sorry, let me see. There is a question uh, from Association Anakil, which is on, um, their question is, do you have to send CVs of staff project to validate before recruitment? We have an experience with the seat of UN Women Morocco. Is this the financial procedure will be the same? Okay, so there are two separate questions. The first one is, whether we have to uh, see any CVs of staff to validate before the recruitment. No, we do not. However, you, as Gemma had mentioned, you have to follow certain procedures when it comes to recruitment and procurement um, of staff. So you have to make sure that there is a, a process that is well documented um, that you can validate when you are audited, if you are audited, on how you actually went through the process and hired a particular person. So whether that means that you have to do some sort of a, you know, a, a vacancy announcement, receive applications, go through a review process, hi, uh, go through interviews, whatever you do to uh, recruit personnel has to be well documented and those records have to be kept. So when requested, you can provide them. You may also be requested to provide them when we do the financial verification. So those are things you need to keep on board um, as part of your general operational and institutional management of the project. Um, the next question is on the experience, whether the financial procedure is similar to what is followed by UN Women in Morocco. The um, short answer is yes. Uh, we do follow the same process. The requirements are the same. However, UN Women um, generally tends to ask for financial reports every three months. Um, we ask for them every six months. So uh, because this is a grant modality, we try to be less burdensome and ask for less reporting periods than um, UN Women would. But the rest of it would remain the same. Um, the next question uh, that I see is from Usuat Martin. He is asking, is it allowed for the grantee to apply for more trust fund grants in the next funding cycle, even when the funding is still running? And the answer to that is no. You are not eligible to apply for another grant from the UN Trust Fund while you have a current active grant with the trust fund. In addition, under the current policies of the trust fund, you are not allowed to ask for, uh, or apply for a grant up to three years after the project has actually ended. So in your case, that would be that you would be eligible for a new funding from the trust fund in six years time. The only exception to this case is if the UN trust fund at the end of the, pro uh, during, you know, close to the end of your project period determines that there is uh, potential for learning at this point, you may be invited to submit a grant under our invitation-only category. 
but that would likely happen only in the final year of your project and happens to and we tend to inv invite only very limited grants even then if you are invited it is a as Gemma had mentioned there is a competitive process so you would still have to compete with all the other organizations that would be applying during that funding period or funding cycle Hey, thank you, Tanya. I think covered all the questions. Um, I will come. I will come back on the question on um, the if there is um, a, a gain of twenty to thirty percent because that is quite an excessive gain. Um, and I will come back on that particular organization as well because if there is a large uh, current situation, uh, perhaps it may be wise to wait until the end of the project period or the final year before potentially using the funds because the exchange rate may also go the other way and we don't want to be in a situation where then you don't have enough funds. So I will, um, also what, if you can please uh, tell me the name of the organization that you're with, I will reach out to you uh, bilaterally as well. Okay, thank you. Well, we, we have just eight minutes left, so if anyone has any... Um, oh, so Kirsty has asked... Um, oh, we have two more, Tanya, if you can see from... Tanya, Tanya, two more questions. Two more questions. Yes, yes. Um, the, I see the question on... The question is, do we need to be using timesheets for our staff mm -hmm. and partner staff? Yes. And the answer is yes. The UN Trust Fund even sends a template that you should be using. So you should be um, uh, keeping timesheets for your staff as well as for your partner organization staff. Is there another question I missed? Um, um, okay, I see a number of questions on exchange rate and um, with, and salaries, etc. cetera. Um, if I can ask, is it possible to um, perhaps have these questions for discussion when we have the financial management training module, because we will be explaining a lot of this in further detail at that time, and we will have our entire finance team there, so they will be able to, um, to provide much more detailed guidance on that. Yeah, so we will have an entire session on financial management. Um, but in the meantime, you asked if you if you have any questions, you can you can always write them to me, or yes. you can write them to your portfolio manager. If you don't know who your portfolio manager is, we will um, you can write to me or Tanya, um, and we will verify all of this um, in the financial management section, and also the handbook is is putting this together. Um, in terms of timesheets, Tanya, does someone asked if they can use their own timesheets? Doesn't have to be our format. Right? As long as yeah, I think yes, I believe you can use your own timesheet. Um, mm -hmm. It's just as I said that it, what is important is to ensure that there is a proper records management because that is what will we will look at when we are reviewing your financial reports, mm -hmm. and that is what an auditor would look at if your project is um, picked for an audit. Thank you. Okay, we have a question from Rob on baseline survey. No, please do not postpone anything. If you have any, um, yes, it's unfortunate the timing of our training. We have to wait until your grants are approved, until the grant awards. Um, please don't wait if you if you've got something like a baseline survey. But what I would suggest you do, Rob, is just email your portfolio manager or me um, with uh, with any questions. What we're mainly interested in is ethics and safety. So what we will want to see is that you have an ethics and safety protocol in place for that survey, especially if you're going to ask beneficiaries personal questions. Um, so please contact us separately. Um, Angelina has asked, how soon should we expect the funding for those who have not received the funds. Oh, I think they're coming soon, right, Valentina or Tanya? Yes, um, Angelina, can you let us know which organization um, you are with? Because all but two organizations um, should have received their funds by now. So if you are, you are one of the organizations that has not, we will follow up with you. 
thank you. And uh, Nisimi, thank you for your recommendation about a sign language interpreter. We will be doing the recorded session with um, subtitles. Unfortunately, not possible to do that on the live session. Um, but um, all of these recommendations will be taken into account as we improve improve the session. Thank you. Um, yeah, so anyone who has not yet received the funds, you can email Tanya or Valentina. Mm -hmm. Okay, we're coming close to... Okay, well, if there's no more questions, we'll close the session. Um, this has been recorded, but we'll also consider doing another session um, due to the technical issues at the beginning. You will also receive a recording with the, with the, with the captions, with the subtitles. And you've also already received the PowerPoint presentation in an email and the script in an email and the grantees handbook. So hopefully you, you have as much a lot of information there to start with. We will be sending you a survey uh, after after the training see whether it, hopefully this helped you improve your knowledge. And this is the first of, of, of ten sessions. So we look forward to uh, working with you over the next uh, few years and especially over the next six months in the start. Correct. Um, so thank you very much, everyone. Tanya, Valentina, you're not on mute. But there's no <laughs> Do you want to say goodbye? There were issues, but did we start the first? Valentina. Yeah. Oh, Tanya. They did. Tanya. Yes. Sorry. Can you hear me? I was on mute. Can you hear me now? You're not on mute. That's why. <laughs> oh, I was outside with Valentina. I apologize for that. Oh, okay. Do you want to say goodbye? And we'll say goodbye yeah. to everyone. Um. Thank you very much. Please, as I said, you know, if you have any further questions or if anything is unclear, please do write to um, Gemma or myself, and we will make sure that your questions are answered as soon as possible. Great. Thanks, everyone. Have a great day. Bye.